Rogers believed that you could use the information that's being provided to you from your body, sort of bottom up to determine when you were being inauthentic or non-congruent and I've thought about this for a long time and, and tried to sort it out in a practical manner and what I've concluded is this you can try this for a couple of weeks, it's, it's an extremely interesting exercise so you sort of have to detach yourself from your thoughts and, your, and, and what you say so you got to assume you start by assuming that what you say and what you think is not necessarily you and of course that's just the case because a lot of what you think, in fact most of what you think and most of what you say are the opinions of other people there are things you've read or things people have told you and you know that that's a benefit in some ways because you get all those thoughts that other people have spent a long time formulating but it's a disadvantage in that it's not exactly you okay so you detach yourself from that you're no longer your thoughts or 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 the things that you say or maybe you're no longer all of them and now what, what you're going to try to find out is which of your thoughts and things that you say are you and maybe so you cannot utilize the rest or maybe so that you can correct the rest because they're not representative of yourself as, a, as an integrated being they don't take everything into account my sense has been that you can tell when you're saying something that's not authentic by feeling out whether or not it makes you weak or strong now you know sometimes when you're conversing with people you can say something that embarrasses yourself now Nietzsche said for example everyone has perjured themselves at least once in the attempt to maintain their good name something like that, it's not an exact quote but I've got the gist of it right so maybe you're saying things to impress someone or you're saying things to remain part of your political group or your social group or whatever or maybe you have attributes, personal attributes that might be positive that you're ashamed of and so you're not going to speak about them so there's a falseness about your self-representation watch for two weeks and see make a rule that if you start to say something and it makes you feel weak it's hard to describe exactly what that means to, to me what it means is that I can feel things coming apart sort of in my midsection so I think it's an autonomic phenomena and the the subjective sense is of, of falsehood it's like I've just stepped off the solid ground and onto something that, that doesn't support me well and it, it feels like a self-betrayal so that's existential inauthenticity you can feel it right away and then the rule is shut up if that happens stop talking and then feel around and see if you can find some words that you can say in that situation that don't produce that sensation and it's like you see this played out in different forms of drama so it's not all that obvious why a cliché is a bad thing but a cliché is a bad thing in the same way that being possessed by the dead is a bad thing it's like a cliché isn't you it's something else, it's like the crowd, it's like the other it's, it's not living, it has nothing to do with you and part of the reason that students use clichés is because it's easier than, than using your own genuine creative formulation so you can just default to cliché use but there's something more insidious than that is that if you write an essay that's nothing but a string of clichés and you get criticized then you're not being criticized what's being criticized is the clichés and you can hide behind that and, and the, the part of you that's wise but, but, but treacherous thinks well the criticism doesn't really apply to me because you know I didn't really say what I thought and then there's this kind of sense you get that you've gotten away with something which is a terrible thing so when I read undergraduate essays what I see very frequently is especially the first essay it's just nothing but cliches it's awful it's, it's dull you can hardly stand reading it because there's nothing in it that's gripping or alive and then maybe the second essay you can see there's a layer of cliche and then now and then the person will be brave enough to poke up a thought of their own it'll just sort of poke up somewhere maybe in three pages in it's like this little green shoot that's barely alive and the, the person is brave enough to pop it up in the hope that you know maybe it won't get walloped down with a sledgehammer and so one of the things I try to do is to point that out it's like look you know this is something there's a real thought here it's a real original thought it's something that you have the right to because it's derived from your own experience and your own knowledge and you formulated it in an original and compelling way but the problem with that is that if you get criticized for that 
you're just going to pull right back into your shell, right? Because that hurts, because it's actually part of you that you've exposed. And that's a terrifying thing to expose yourself like that. But it, it's, it's an absolute prerequisite to genuine communication and thought. So, the ancient Mesopotamians, I haven't got time to tell you this story. If you want to hear it, you can come to my Maps of Meaning class in your fourth year. But the Mes ancient Mesopotamians had figured out 5,000 years ago or so that the, the highest god in the hierarchy of God, so sort of like the highest value, or the thing that should be imitated most carefully, was a god that, whose, uh, whose head had eyes all the way around it, and who spoke magic words. And so the words he spoke could make the sun rise and make the sun set. Very, very powerful speaker. And the reason the Mesopotamians had figured this out to, to the degree they had was because they realized that the capacity to pay attention, which is the eyes, of course, because we really pay attention with our eyes, and then the capacity to speak properly is, in fact, the highest virtue. And so then you can check yourself. You can see. All you have to do is listen, like you would listen to someone else. And you have to feel, you think, do I actually believe that? Is that actually my thought? And really, I'll tell you, what you'll find is 95% of what you say has nothing to do with you. So it's quite shocking to do this, because you'll start to say something, and you'll think, oh, that doesn't feel quite right. Like, it doesn't make me feel solid when I say it. There's something about that that I'm subordinating myself to something, or hiding in some way. It's very difficult to figure out exactly what you're doing. But you'll find out that almost everything that's abstractly represented, it has to be that way, because you guys are all so young. So in some sense, you know way more than you can actually know, right? You've been taught all these things, but you don't know them. They're just in your head. In fact, they have you, rather than the other way around. It's like Carl Jung said, people don't have ideas. Ideas have people. And that's something to really think about, because then you want to watch and see what ideas there are floating around in your head and start to figure out where they came from, because it's highly probable that they're controlling you, just like a marionette is controlled by the puppeteer. It's very, very similar. 